How do you solve the unsolvable problem? How do you diagnose that disease that can't be diagnosed? Or reach that lesion that just can't be reached? A small group of clinicians at Cincinnati Children's Hospital from very different backgrounds and disciplines came together to do just that. Combined their range of skill, some cutting edge technology, and a little bit of an innovative mindset, and you have a solution to the unsolvable. Let's get to know our clinicians in this podcast. First, we have Dr. Greg Berg. Pediatric pulmonologist that does a lot of bronchoscopy here at Cincinnati Children's. Dr. Chris Tao. Pediatric pulmonologist, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and the director of the Rare Lung Diseases Program. And Dr. Eric Heisinger. One of the pediatric pulmonologists at Cincinnati Children's and the director of our bronchopulmonary dysplasia center. And I spend a lot of time with our aerodigestive group doing bronchoscopy. And they've been working for the last about 10 years to really trying to advance interventional bronchoscopy in pediatrics. And a respiratory therapist here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I am Carolyn Wallace. I am a respiratory therapist on the bronchoscopy team and run the bronch program. Also, we have Dr. John Rocadio. I'm a pediatric interventional radiologist, and I'm fortunate enough to be helping head up collaborations between IR and other surgical services and other interventionalists in our hybrid OR at Cincinnati Children's. And Nicole Hilbert, interventional radiology technologist and run our image guided surgery program here at Cincinnati Children's. Together, this multidisciplinary team were able to find, reach, and treat lung lesions that could not otherwise be treated. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Staker and Podcasts. We're back with another episode for our image guided surgery series. I'm Ellen and Cisco. And I'm M. Tom Bash. We are research fellows at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So let's start with the case. Here's Dr. Heisinger telling us about the patient. The patient is 12 or 13 years old and he has granulomatosis and polyangiitis. And he presented with a particularly unusual phenotype of that. He had been a competitive basketball player and then circa December of 2021, just developing very severe exertional dyspnea. By February, he was in a wheelchair and couldn't even walk from the car to his doctor's appointments. Got a bronchoscopy at his local facility and what they found was diffuse bronchial stenosis and his lung function had dropped down to about 35% of predicted and presumably all because of his distal bronchial scarring. And Dr. Heisinger explains that one of the challenges that they have in kids is the, the equipment size. They don't have the tools that are really designed to do a bronchial dilation in a kid's peripheral bronchi. You know, size has often been a limitation for these procedures. The scopes and equipment that they have had historically is just too big. They're made for adults. And the other issue with instruments is that smaller instruments mean smaller, potentially unusable biopsies. Our biggest scope is the smallest scope used in adult medicine, which is about four, four and a half millimeters in diameter, which gives us a two millimeter biopsy force up, which is really too small to diagnose most parenchymal lung diseases because you're not getting full lung architecture with such small pieces. You're just getting fragments of the lung. I think that's one of the challenges. These kids get smaller and smaller. Our tools also get smaller and smaller. And as we decrease in size, the functionality of the equipment it's really difficult to use. That was Carolyn Wallace, the respiratory therapist who works with the group. And so we kind of have to think outside the box and get really creative on how to actually target these areas with tools that aren't very effective and develop the skills to be able to be accurate in these really tiny airways. And it sounds like they've gotten to be able to do procedures on pretty small kids. We had an eight-year-old we brought back that had an underlying malignancy that we use the hybrid room this was one of the cases where we had treated the patient for infection and done intraop imaging and found that the mass or lesion had shrunk. And so we did not proceed with biopsies, but we were able to do all of our combined evaluation. And again, that was Dr. Greg Berg. And Dr. Arcadia says there's a lot more on the horizon. You know, they're working with the pulmonologists, with some of the device companies to come up with better tools. Like we talked about, these are small kids, small airways to make even better tools for the team to be able to, to work with even smaller kids. So that's been an exciting part of our collaboration as well as, is having this research lab to try some of these new techniques and potentially collaborate with outside vendors to make pediatric specific tools. 
And let's not forget that if we have smaller tools for smaller kids, that means we have a broader spectrum of patient population that we can treat and they don't have to wait for until they grow up. Dr. Heisinger points out that the hybrid operating room does a few things for them. One is it gives us much greater fidelity at being able to navigate to lesions in real time and to do it more quickly. And then the other big thing is it solves the problem of size at least for a vast majority of patients. And Dr. Heisinger said, with combining the efforts of intervention and radiology in the hybrid OR, they can really get down to much more smaller kids. And they think they could probably use these techniques down to two, three, maybe four-year-olds, which would cover the vast majority of patients who would benefit from targeted biopsies with minimally invasive technique. That was a quick aside about the instruments. The team is working together to get smaller instruments to provide the best care for these patients. Let's get back to the case. Here's Dr. Heisinger. And so we look back on some experience that occurred in the hybrid, some combined interventional radiology techniques and uh, pulmonology techniques to dilate and then really adapted that to this particular patient. This patient underwent multiple bronchoscopies and bronchial dilations. He had gone from competitive basketball to wheelchair bound to now he's back playing basketball and his lung function is up in the 70s, up from the 30s where he had been. Three years ago, I would have told him I don't really have an option with the possible exception of doing a lung transplant, possibly with a bone marrow transplant to see if we can give you some symptom relief for your breathing. So he's been really quite a success story. Amazing story. It's awesome that it worked out for that patient. Let's talk about another piece of how the hybrid operating room and image-guided surgery has helped these procedures. And this relates to how they're able to see where they're going when they're doing procedures like transbronchial biopsies. We know that there are lots of different ways to do biopsies in the lung. We can do it percutaneously. We can do it open if we had to. But a minimally invasive way of doing this is transbronchial biopsies. So here's Dr. Berg telling us a little bit about how they used to do it, how they started doing these transbronchial biopsies. Really came out of the lung transplant world and they weren't blind, but they were done under two-dimensional fluoro, which would just be one plane in time. So they weren't exactly sure where they were obtaining the biopsies from. We had a general sense, but in 3D space, we were unable to confirm that we were going to be inside of a lesion, particularly a small lesion. And the hybrid OR has enabled us to do real-time imaging and mapping that advanced our ability to target lesions. Obviously, that's experience with transbronchial biopsy. It's just for the sake of equipment size and different things like that. As much as the 3D imaging is helping us supplement our knowledge of the airways and the lungs, when we add another technology in like ultrasound evaluation on a bronchoscope, we now sense a, another dimension that we're adding to our, our toolbox or our evaluation. And I think it's fair to say that we're still learning. That's one thing I think that I would add is these lesions are not easy to get to, and we have to create a roadmap on how to get to these difficult lesions. A lot of times they might be really sharp angles. And again, that was Carolyn Wallace, a respiratory therapist that works with the group. And not only in the right upper, but in other areas where they get really small. So having this image-guided roadmap to get us to the same spot to get multiple biopsies eight to 10 times has been extremely helpful. And Nicole summarizes their collaboration between pulmonology and interventional radiology. So we've been putting together not only just the imaging capabilities, but also our tips and tools that we have in IR with pulmonology and their capabilities and all their equipment and seeing what works best. Prior to having the technology and the equipment from the hybrid OR, we probably seldom, if ever, did targeted lung biopsies through a bronchoscope. If we couldn't directly visualize what we were biopsying, there's no way we would have attempted it. And the lesions we're talking about are really beyond the field of view of our bronchoscope. 90% of the time. And again, that was Dr. Chris Tao. When we do traditional bronchoscopy, we may go down two, three generations, maybe four if we're getting ambitious in the airways. But every generation has two or three choices as far as which airway to go down. By the time you get down and make two or three, four choices, you could be in a completely different part of the lung. Go further and further and further. It's harder and harder to really know exactly where you're going. And it would be easy. It's easy to get lost, it sounds like 
going down the airways and going down all the small bronchioles. And so that's where image guided surgery can help them. And Dr. Tao states that before they had these guide techniques from interventional radiology, they wouldn't even try to do it because the chances of them to hitting the target were so minuscule and the risks were still relatively high. These procedures are enabling patients to undergo endoscopic evaluation rather than more invasive thoracotomies or fluoroscopies. That was Dr. Greg Bird. I think what's helped our patients is that we're able to provide diagnostic yield without having to undergo major surgery. Our benefit to risk ratio is increased dramatically with this technology. Yeah, it sounds like really this relationship has blossomed a lot as they started using the hybrid operating room more. One thing that I've realized in having interventional radiology in the peri-op environment is that there's an opportunity to collaborate a lot more with other services. So here, Dr. Riccario keeps explaining how they started to collaborate with the pulmonology team. I think it really was a discussion just in a hallway saying, hey, John, we've got this kid with a certain lesion. We're wondering if you might be able to help us. And I said, we can do our intraoperative CTs and there's some navigational capabilities that we could potentially use for to help with these transbronchial biopsies. So we just basically started doing it. And Ellen, uh, Dr. Riccario states that through the multidisciplinary approach, they have more options and people can learn from each other and understand the different capabilities of their expertise and also the technology that hybrid OR is bringing to them. You know, as we've highlighted in other episodes, they've worked with a number of specialties, but it sounds like with the pulmonology team, they've really been able to expand quite a lot. Yeah, and this was cool because from the beginning, we involved EMT because that's typically who you guys dilate with before our relationship. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. My EMT here does airway dilations dozens of times a week, I suspect, at this facility. And I think one of the interesting things as an IR tech perspective is when I watched them going with the balloon, I just assumed everyone has the same kind of balloons. But it's interesting is they actually did not have end hold catheters, so they just had Fogarty balloons so they could get down to an area but they couldn't put a wire to actually select and navigate a little bit differently. We used our typical tools. We'd be using interventional radiology for angioplasty. Various catheters and guide wires can help navigate to areas of stenosis and blood vessels. Why not do this with direct vision with our pulmonologists? And Dr. Ricardio says they use a combination of direct vision and fluoroscopy to guide the catheter and guide wire across a narrowing to do the balloon dilation. It's really the same thing that we would do in a blood vessel, but it's in an airway, the same techniques and the same catheters, but certainly I think a different application for these pediatric patients. So this was something that I really had never seen described in the literature, but we're just trying to think of what tools do we have and how can we try to open up this space as safely as humanly possible and see if we can give this kid some lung back. And that was Dr. Heisinger, one of the pulmonologists. By doing it in the hybrid OR under CT guidance, we at least have much better ideas that there's no major blood vessels on the other side of that membrane. Again, that was Dr. Chris Tao. And in the event of a pneumothorax, we also are very readily able to manage the pneumothorax if it occurs, if we're poking something that we don't really want to be doing. And here, Dr. Roccario explains the importance of preparation beforehand. I think it's real important to also note that this technique didn't just happen on the fly. A week beforehand, we're sizing catheters, what will go through the working channel, what balloon might go through, what wires will be long enough. And it takes a lot of coordination and time to figure out what would they need in the hybrid OR to help the patients. We essentially had practiced what would fit in you know, different sizes of things. So when it came time to actually do this clinically in the patient, we knew what to expect. And thankfully, everything did work out quite well. It really sounds like a lot of thought goes into the procedure, including thinking about where everyone's going to stand, how you're going to position yourselves, what equipment you're going to use. That's amazing. The total team effort to get to the point where we could try this and also to actually do it um, and be able to adapt on the fly was also something really valuable. The logistics and the ergonomics of how the physicians actually approach the case, those are things that you overlook a lot, and but they actually make or break the case. If a doctor's back is cramping up and you can't hold the catheter or the wire any longer, that can be a huge impact into how they approach the care. Again, it's really been fulfilling to, to collaborate with the pulmonology team, and it's actually really fun. They're a great group. And I think the next step, which we're already at, is 
to be able to present some of these techniques and these collaborations at our various meetings. It sounds like the pulmonology group and the hybrid OR group in Cincinnati Children's are doing these procedures very well. But Dr. Ricario believes these procedures shouldn't be unique to Cincinnati Children's only. Be able to disseminate some of this knowledge and these techniques to other institutions around the country and around the world has a great potential to help a lot of other kids that maybe would not have been able to be helped in the past. Awesome. It sounds like there's this amazing collaboration again between interventional radiology and another team, in this case, pulmonology, to really help a lot of kids get good care without invasive procedures. So here we talked about new innovations and taking care of kids with lung lesions or bronchial stenoses. The pulmonology team and interventional radiology team have done a lot of work in terms of finding the appropriate equipment and the appropriately sized instruments for the kids. They do a lot of research before cases, try to figure out the best path, and they use image guidance to be able to navigate towards what might be small lesions in a large network of small bronchioles. They've really been able to introduce minimally invasive options for, in this case, pulmonary lesions. And as we've highlighted in other episodes in this series, this work really highlights the multidisciplinary care that can go toward improving care for patients. Here we talked about how the radiologists are involved, the pulmonologists, respiratory therapists, and they mentioned that they worked with ENT in the past and if they needed to, they could get general and thoracic surgery involved. So working together really holds a huge benefit for the kids. If you liked this episode, leave us a rating and review wherever you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and as always, download the Stay Current in Pediatric Surgery app where we have more podcasts, videos, and more. I'm Ellen and Cisco. And I'm M. Tombash. And this is the Stay Current Podcast and stay tuned for more. Mm-hmm.